invite up Brad. Thanks, Caitlin. Excellent job on those announcements. So chipper. I just, I felt like I wanted to do all of them. Just because just you said to. <clears throat> um, okay, well, we'll uh, pray and then uh, jump into uh, the word here. Um, is it possible maybe we could bring up the lights here somehow or the other a little bit? Yeah, that actually helped a ton. Thank you. Um, okay, well, Father, we ask you in Jesus' name for your help that as we look at the Word of God, that it would just make more sense than it's probably going to if you don't help us. We pray that you would give us wisdom and revelation to understand the Scriptures and that these ideas would make sense and that, Lord, we would be able to connect dots uh, from many other things that we've already been taught and learned and heard uh, from the Word in Jesus' name. Well, we're in our series on the 150 chapters on the end times, and tonight uh, is going to be the second part of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Um, Deuteronomy 28 is a long chapter, and it, we just couldn't get it all in one session. There's, there's way too much content. And so uh, we divided it up into two. So I uh, apologize for those of you who are like, how many weeks ago was that? Or I wasn't here that night. Uh, available online. You know, one of the things that we're doing with this is we're going slow enough through these 150 chapters that we can really kind of marinate in the subject of the end times. And so it probably would be impossible for everybody to understand everything that's happening every week. But to have a little bit of wisdom from this night and a little bit of understanding from this night and a scripture here that made sense and this theme that really made sense, coming together kind of week after week, uh, these things will start to solidify. And for many of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you were in that boat at one point coming around here and going, I don't understand any of this stuff, but as you heard the themes over and over, things started to make sense. So with that being the case, we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 28, and this will be our second part. We'll do a little review on what we did in the first part, but I I just want to highlight Deuteronomy is one of the first five books of the Bible. It was written by Moses, and we're talking about some really, really old Bible verses here. I mean, these are thousands of years old, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of years old. And, uh, and we've got Moses drafting this information by the spirit. He's talking about what God is going to do with the nation of Israel, either good or bad, depending on the way that the nation of Israel responds to him. Well, what he's actually doing along the way, or also is he's painting a a picture of what's going to happen at Israel's best and also at Israel's worst uh, state or worst predicament. And uh, both of those in their fullest expression are actually future. The hardest times Israel's ever going to face, and she has gone through hard times, is still yet ahead in the end times. And the best times with the presence of God and the glory of God resting on that nation the presence in such a way, the, the promises, the prosperity at such a level that Israel has never experienced. And Israel has experienced some really sweet seasons uh, in their history. We're talking about the best and the worst times for Israel are still ahead. And the book of Deuteronomy, specifically Deuteronomy 28, we'll look at a couple other chapters here in the future. But Deuteronomy 28 paints this picture of what it's going to look like with Israel at its worst and Israel at its best. In the first session, we covered a lot of the good stuff and we covered a handful of the bad stuff. Tonight, we're actually going to get into the hardest of the hard stuff, the hardest of the difficulties. Uh, And there's a lot of information. In fact, half the chapter, you could say, is about the good stuff and most of the bad stuff. And then the other half of the chapter is the really, really bad stuff takes up the whole extra half of the chapter. I mean, that's what kind of intensity that God gives to the subject matter that we're going to be looking at tonight. So quick review, the blessings and the curses uh, that are uh, assigned to the nation of Israel in this covenant that God made and then articulates in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, The uh, the blessings set high above the nations, Israel would uh, would have blessings on their livestock, with blessings on their crops, blessings on the fruit of their womb, that they wouldn't miscarry, that they have lots of kids. Uh, God would scatter Israel's enemies. Israel would be set apart as God's people, that he would deal with Israel differently and look at Israel differently as his specific, his nation. 
And all the peoples of the earth would honor Israel. All those things in their fullest expression are still future. And we're going to see those uh, during the millennial reign of Christ. But then we also looked at some of the curses. And there were curses on all those good things. Now there's curses on the fruit of the womb, curses on the crops and the livestock. Curses in every direction was one of the phrases. That's just a horrible thought. Wasting disease, droughts, locusts, worms to also devour. The diseases of Egypt and every kind of sickness. Those are just awful things. You think, how could it get worse than that? It gets worse than that. <clears throat> Up to this point, we've only been looking at, related to the curses, we've only been looking at internal problems. We've only been looking at ways that God was going to send curses and difficulties, trials, and all sorts of problems that were still only God dealing with the nation and using the elements, the weather, using you know all manner of different disease and stuff, but it's God behind the scenes doing it. This is the first time tonight that we're going to be transitioning away from those sorts of curses and problems to now God using Israel's enemies as the hand of God to discipline Israel. That's just so much worse. It's so much worse. You know, David, when he had his, uh, one of his kind of key moments, <clears throat> and he was told that he was going to be punished for it, and he got to pick, which version of punishment do you want? And he said, oh, let God deal with us. Don't hand us into the, the hands of our enemies. Like, that's the absolute worst, because who knows what they're going to do to us. At least God sending us a problem or a disease. It's God who's kind behind the work. He says, but please don't hand us over to our enemies, because who knows what they're capable of. Well, God's promise is actually an escalation, and that if these things don't work, if this problem doesn't work, and this disease, and this issue, if these things don't work, I will hand you even over to your enemies, and I'm the one that's going to do it. I'm actually going to be responsible for this. That's part of the reason that we've got all this drafted in Deuteronomy 28 so that we can see that and understand that concept. That is a difficult concept to understand, that God would actually use Israel's enemies that are going to be really mean and bad to Israel, that he would even use them in order to turn the nation of Israel back. The idea is that Israel is supposed to see the progression of events, bad thing, worse thing, even worse thing, oh my gosh, and then hand it over to enemies, see it and go, we are out of alignment with God. We are supposed to see this as a sign from heaven. We're God's nation. We're God's people. How could this happen if we were in good relationship with God and that's supposed to light bulb, we're not in right relationship with God and then turn back to the Lord. That's what's supposed to happen. Now, just as a previous little uh, thought process, um, in uh, uh, let's see here. You know, God makes his strongest rebuke to Israel in sending the nations to trouble her into repentance. That is just a, a wild and uh, problematic idea. All right, so now let's go to page two here. And uh, we're uh, looking at the, this passage that now talks about Israel being defeated by her enemies. <clears throat> so we're going to read Deuteronomy 28, 25 and following. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven. You will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the wild animals. And there will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors, festering sores and the itch from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. At midday, you will grope about like a blind person in the dark. You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day, you'll be oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. You'll be pledged to be married to a woman, but another will take her and rape her. You'll be, you will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard. You will not even begin to enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will eat none of it. Your donkey will be forcibly taken from you and not returned. Your sheep will be given over to your enemies and no one will rescue you. Your sons and daughters will be given to another nation and you will wear out your eyes watching for them day after day, powerless to lift a hand. 
A people that you do not know will eat what your land and your labor produce, and you will have nothing but cruel oppression all your days. The sights you see will drive you mad. The Lord will afflict your knees and legs with painful boils that cannot be cured, spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. The Lord will drive you and the king that, let's see said that wrong. The Lord will drive you and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or to your ancestors. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. You will become a thing of horror, a byword, and an object of ridicule among the peoples where the Lord drive, will drive you. You will have sons and daughters, but you'll not keep them because they will go into captivity. The foreigners who reside among you will rise above you higher and higher, but you will sink lower and lower. They will lead you. Uh, they they will lend to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head, but you will be the tail. In hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. This is just thoroughly depressing and completely avoidable. But what's being described here, actually, while there have been seasons of time where Israel has been out of alignment with God, I mean, that's very real, and where God has done this, you can think about the Babylonians, you can think of a couple other times in history. There have been some specific times that have been pretty bad and pretty hard. The fullness of this is still yet future. And there's some details that are specific to this passage that we actually don't have any historic uh, um, expression of that we know of. I mean, it's possible that things have happened in the nation of Israel that didn't get recorded or didn't get written in the Bible or didn't get recorded in history. But as far as any clear answer, there are a few details here that have not happened before. So we're going to look at uh, some of the details. So it's always been God's way to use every available measure in his arsenal to correct his people before allowing things to escalate to recruiting outside help to course correct. It's always been God's way to do everything he can to get Israel to turn to him before he uses other nations to course correct Israel. But he will go that far. He absolutely will. When Israel does not respond to all previous measures, he'll allow Israel's enemies to greatly harm her in order to draw her back to himself. The statement, defeated before your enemies, will never have been more true than how the events of the end time drama will play out. While it's been true, there have been times where that has absolutely been the case, it will never have been truer then when we look at the reality of the end time drama, we see the, the whole situation as it all unfolds, we'll see the fullness of this in a way that makes the rest of history look pale by comparison. And there have been some really hard times in Israel's history. I mean, when we think about the events of World War II, it is unbelievable to think that there could be something worse coming, and there is. And that's why it's so important that the church has revelation of this so that we could stand with Israel in her darkest hour, which is yet ahead. Food for the wild animals. This is just so crazy, but it says it. It says your carcasses will be food for the birds and the wild animals, and there'll be no one to frighten them away. This will not be only Israel. The end time drama tells us, I mean, even seal four in the book of Revelation, chapter six, Seal 4 tells us that one of the plagues at the end of the age is going to be wild animals that are empowered by like demonic forces, but under God's leadership, that wild animals are going to be ravenous and going to come into towns and cities and do things that they've never done before, attacking people and all kinds of stuff. But one of the pictures here is also <clears throat> when you're in the midst of war and it's constant, you don't have time to do upkeep. And so things like burying the dead, that is a very humane and normal priority for people, to bury the dead. But when war keeps going on, when problems keep ensuing, there's not going to be time for that. And so this is describing, in, uh, in addition to some times in Israel's history where this was probably true for short seasons, this is describing a situation at the end of the age where not just Israel, this is actually going to be in many places on the planet, 
There's going to be so much war and turmoil that people actually can't prioritize burying of the dead. And so what's going to happen is they're going to be left out. And as a result, then the birds and the animals. That's just so intense. I mean, that is an unthinkable curse when you're the people of God that God just got you out of Egypt. Because remember, the timeline of, of Deuteronomy being written, it's right after the Exodus. They've just come out of Egypt. God has just shown himself to be their God. He's like, I am your God. You are my people. I treat you special. Oh, but also there's some rules. And you can't just live however you want. You've got to walk in covenant with me. And if you do, I'm going to bless you in ways you can't even imagine. But if you don't, I'm going to prove to you I'm your God. I'm going to prove to everybody that I'm your God. And so as that people, you just go, it's unthinkable that God would say, I'll allow you to such a point of difficulty, trial, and depravity that you won't be able to bury the dead and animals will get to them. I mean, that's like, how bad do we have to get out of sorts with you? He's like, exactly. And that's the reason for this covenant, this really, really intense covenant that we find some of the details here in Deuteronomy chapter 28. All right, additional afflictions. This latter part of Deuteronomy 28 includes some other problems, plagues that God promises. It, to be honest, letter C here would have better fit in the last session, but you know, for the most part, I was kind of breaking the chapter up into first, cha first half of the chapter, second half of the chapter for the most part, because these plagues really are so much in alignment with what we covered in the last session. But let's read it real quick. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors and with festering sores and the itch, which you cannot be cured. He will inflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. These are horrible things. It doesn't say you'll come across these things or some of your people will have this happen naturally. He says, I'm going to do it to you. I will send you confusion of mind. I will send you the boils of Egypt. Not the boils of Egypt. That was how you dealt with your enemies. He's like, do not get out of sorts with me. I will treat you the way I treated your enemies. I will afflict you with blindness. I mean, this is so intense. And um, then it says the... The Lord will afflict your, le your knees and your legs with painful boils that cannot be cured, spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. Painful boils and sores. That's just, oh, from God in modern day. See, that's the thing. We're talking about sores and such that cannot be cured, but the fullness of these verses is still future. So with modern medicine... With modern technology, with modern situation, all that, there's going to be such circumstances or diseases of such a sort that they will be incurable. Oh my gosh, that's so intense. So hard to think about. One of the hardest wholesale statements that I think of in this whole chapter of Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28 is filled with really hard phrases, okay? One of the hardest, if not the hardest in my mind, is the phrase... You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Like the Lord is like, I'm going to come after you. And I will see to it that everything you try won't work. Like all the natural principles of life. I'm going to see to it that you will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Can you just take a moment and actually think about the love of God in this moment? If there was ever a time where the people of Israel could identify every single thing we put our hands to, we are unsuccessful. That there's a Bible verse about that, and it's actually not to be mean. It's actually to get them back into right standing so that they can be with God and have all the blessings that God wants to give them. This is a profound statement that the Lord says, I will see to it that you will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Gosh, that's bad. That is really, really painful. And then you'll be given over to your enemies. Look, your sheep will be given to your enemies. No one will rescue you. Your sons and daughters will be given over to your enemies. Uh, you'll be powerless to lift a hand. And a people that you do not know will eat of the fruit of your land and your produce and you will know nothing but cruel oppression all your days. It's cruel oppression because of the invading enemies that the Lord says he's responsible to bring. 
This is really challenging, and it's very much the story of the end time uh, drama. There's going to be wars until the end, and then there's going to be this Antichrist that comes in and he signs a peace treaty. And the world is going to celebrate this man because of this peace treaty. He's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel and all the nations that have been beating up on Israel, that Israel's been at war with. And Israel will actually be standing to some degree in war against all these nations because war doesn't continue if all the nations win. Does that make sense? If all the invading nations win, there's no Israel to continue to war with. But there will be war all the way until the end, and then this, the Antichrist will step in and say, I have the solution. Let's sign a seven-year ceasefire. Let's get everybody on page, on the same you know, page. Let's get everybody together. We're going to do a, a time of peace. And everybody's going to go, this is the best thing ever. And the Jews are going to go, this is the best thing ever. Because they're going to finally get to experience that peace. There will have been war all the way up till that point. There will have been tremendous difficulties. And yet the difficulties that will come right after by the guy that signed the peace treaty, He's going to break it at the halfway point. And he's going to say, I am actually God and you must worship me. And nobody's going to be on board with that. I mean, that is, that is going to be the most offensive thing in Israel. It's going to be really, really challenging. And at that point, the Antichrist and his goons are going to invade the nation of Israel in a way that will be inescapable. Part of, I'm just assuming, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, so this is definitely a subjective thought from, from me, okay? I'm assuming a significant part of that seven-year peace treaty will be disarmament, will be the nation of Israel having to lay down a significant amount of their arms, demilitarization, all that kind of stuff, so that the Antichrist can pull the rug at the three-and-a-half-year mark and Israel's defenseless, okay? Otherwise, Israel would defend itself at the three-and-a-half-year mark. But I think that that's going to be a big piece of it, as well as all the, you know, the, the strength of the Antichrist coming in, and it's described as a people that you do not know will rule over you, okay? All right, <clears throat> let's go to the next page. You will become a thing of horror. The horrifying events of the end times will cause the nations to pity Israel. Even the nations that are against Israel will look at Israel and go, you guys really got it bad. This is really bad. That is like bad, bad. What will be done to the nation of Israel in an overtly focused way will highlight the gravity of being God's chosen people and choosing to not be in alignment with him and what he'll do. It says, you will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. In order to become a horror to all the kingdoms on the earth, there must be modern technology in order for word to be able to get out. All the kingdoms of the earth. There's never been a time in human history where there could be something going on on the other side of the world and every kingdom, every nation on the planet would be aware of it. So even that is partly helping us to understand the modernization of the world is part of how the fullness of this could even happen because you'll become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. All of them will hear about it and go, that is just awful. You'll become a thing of horror, a byword, and an object of ridicule among all the peoples where the Lord will drive you. It's just it's going to be so incredibly difficult. Again, this context, these things have been in part, you know, it, it could definitely have been said after Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the rest of Israel was in shambles, it could definitely have been said that lots of nations heard about it and went, that is horrible. That's really bad. But not all of them. Not all of them would have even known about it. And some of them would have heard so little that it wouldn't have really, really bothered them. But what's going to happen to the degree and to the widespreadness of the information will cause all the peoples of the earth, all the kingdoms of the earth to look at Israel and go, oh my gosh, it's such a horrible thing. This is the great disparity between after Jesus comes, it says, all the nations of the earth will call Israel blessed. All the nations of the earth will go, not a thing of horror, a thing of glory, a thing of beauty. Under the leadership of Jesus, the exact opposite. So Israel is really going to be in an increasing way from now until into the millennium is going to be increasingly the focus of the planet, planet's attention. We're entering into a season now, I believe, where it's starting to begin a little bit. 
where the whole earth is going to start kind of paying attention, but it's only going to increase as the things intensify for a lot of reasons. Now, the reverse of last week or last session, we looked at all the promises. You'll be the head and not the tail. You will lend, you know, and not borrow. Uh, you know, you, you'll be the first and not last. All those precious phrases about Israel. And now God says, but if you don't stand with me, I'm going to do the opposite. It says, the foreigners who reside among you will rise above you higher and higher. The foreigners will rise above you. No, no, that's not how that's supposed to work. Israel's supposed to be in charge of Israel. Nope. God says, I'm going to bring foreigners in. They will rise above you higher and higher. You, however, will sink lower and lower. They will lend to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head and you will be the tail in your own land. Oh, gosh. And you will wither away is really the essence of Deuteronomy uh, 28, 48. In hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty, you'll serve the enemies that the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The absolute painful realities of the past. There have been so many atrocities. There have been horrible things that have happened in the past in, in Israel. Committed by the hands of Israel's enemies against Israel. These are painful. They are awful, but they are only partial fulfillment of what is coming. Part of the reason we have got to be a people that know the word and believe it is because our future is filled with the craziest things imaginable to humanity. Craziest good, craziest bad, craziest just bizarre. The Bible tells us about tons of things that are yet future, but we're unprepared for those things if one, we don't read our Bible, and two, we don't believe what's written. The problem is we're reading phrases that are crazy. It's impossible. How could that happen? And we got to take it at its face value and go, the Lord said it. It's going to happen. If it hasn't happened yet and it's written in the Bible, it has to still happen in the future. We've got to get that settled. If God said it, it must take place and it will. And most of what hasn't happened in the Bible is still going to happen and at the end times in in all unfolding in one period of uh, time, one generation. All right, now let's look at the next piece of Deuteronomy chapter 28. So we just looked at whatever, you know, through verse 48 or something like that. No, no, maybe verse 42 for the most part. All right, so now let's look here. Prophecy of the fearful nat na nation. This is a strange bad promise. When we read this, it's got some language points that you're like, that is peculiar, unique, weird, bad. It is a really interesting combination of uh, problems. So unique that if it happens, or rather when it happens, they're supposed to know this is exactly what God said was going to happen. That's part of the point of the uniqueness of it. So now we're going to be reading Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 59, bottom of page four. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth. Like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you do not understand. A fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock, the crops of your land, until you are destroyed. They will leave you no grain, new wine, or olive oil, nor any calves of your herds or lambs of your flocks until you are ruined. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout their land until your high fortified walls in which you trust fall. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of the womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters the Lord has given you. Even the most gentle and sensitive man among you will have no compassion on his brother or the wife he loves or his surviving children. And he will not give to one of them any of the flesh of his children that he is eating. It will be all he has left because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege of all your cities." The most gentle and sensitive woman among you, so sensitive and gentle that she would not venture to touch the ground with the sole of her feet, <coughs> will begrudge the husband she loves 
and her own son and daughter, the afterbirth from her womb and the children she bears. For in her dire need, she intends to eat them secretly because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege of your cities. If you do not carefully follow the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants. This is horrifying. There are pieces of this that were fulfilled uh, during the siege of the Babylonian, uh, the Babylonians. There are pieces of it. But there are pieces that weren't and pieces that will only find their fullest fulfillment at the end of this age. Let's talk first about this fierce looking nation. And again, I recognize this fierce looking nation and many of these details that we just read really did apply to the, uh, the siege of, of Jerusalem from Babylon. I recognize that. But the fullness of this will yet have, uh, have expression in the end times. The Lord will bring on you a, a nation from far away, from the ends of the earth, an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you do not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. One of the things that we uh, have even seen here in recent days related to the attacks uh, on Israel uh, from Hamas is that very peace, that without any respect for the old or pity for the young, I mean, there's been just horrible things that have, have happened there. One of the details about the way that the Antichrist is going to swoop in and do this is the reality that how quickly that whole swooping down thing, there's a picture of that that is like so specific to the way that the Antichrist is going to invade Israel in the middle of a seven-year peace treaty. I mean, it's like swooping in like out of nowhere, like how did this happen so instantly without any warning? I mean, we were totally caught off guard by this. Let me just give you this... We just read Deuteronomy 28. Remember, Deuteronomy, Moses, thousands of years before Jesus. That's where, where we're reading right now. These are old, old prophecies. But now read the book of Daniel and read the description that's given about the Antichrist. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. Succeed in whatever he does. God just said to Israel, a time will come if you don't walk with me where I will see to it that you are unsuccessful in all you do. And I will bring a guy in. I will anoint a guy to come in and actually be successful in all that he does. And he is a fierce looking king and there's horrible atrocities that he's going to accomplish. And here we are back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 where God says, I'm going to send a fierce looking nation that will not have any respect for you, and they will come in and plunder you. All right, they'll devour everything in the land. Um, just thinking about all the wars that are going to happen before the end and all the ways that that will be partial fulfillments of the things that are written here in Deuteronomy 28. But then ultimately, the Antichrist is going to come in, and he is going to just bring such devastation. You know, part of the reason that there's going to be such need for a peace treaty is because things are going to be so ravished and ransacked and blown up and problems and stolen from and, and destroyed. So the Antichrist coming in and saying, I'll bring a treaty, let's fix all this, let's calm it all down, is going to be such, is going to be so needed, is going to be so looked to as a right and good thing and a right solution. Now, if the nation of Israel were walking with God at that time, and we're paying attention to the scriptures, they would know exactly what's happening. And I have no doubt there will be some voices in the land of Israel that are standing up with Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 9 and, and reading it and going, what are we doing? We're giving into this very treaty that we were, we were told about back in Daniel. But the majority of the nation will be secular, will not be thinking at all about those things, is not walking with the Lord and is going to wind up in this you know, dire uh, situation. <clears throat> Lay siege all the cities. One of the most significant connection points of this prophecy to the end time storyline is the uniqueness of all the cities being laid siege to. While this was mostly fulfilled when Babylon invaded the land and eventually took the nation into captivity, it's going to happen again under Antichrist and his reign of terror will extend globally far beyond uh, Israel alone. So let's just read this real quick. 
Deuteronomy 28, 52, and then we're going to read Habakkuk 2, because Deuteronomy 28 tells us about what God is going to do with Israel in relationship to all the cities. Habakkuk 2 tells us what God is going to do under the Antichrist to all the cities of all the nations, and we see that the parallel is there. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. So that's a prophecy against Israel, all the cities of Israel. But then look at Habakkuk 2 in the context of the Antichrist. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. This isn't just talking about Israel, this is talking about lands and cities all over the earth because that's what the Antichrist is going to do. It's just the Antichrist is going to aim the bulk of his aggression or how about the, the, the fierceness of his aggression at Israel, but he's going to take that aggression all over the whole earth. So the interesting thing that we read here, when we're looking at these blessings and curses, the, the curses, the covenant is made with the nation of Israel, but God is going to deal with the whole earth in a like manner. And if there are places and people that are walking with God, God will treat them differently. But if there's places, people, nations that are not, God is going to treat them in a like manner to the way that he's promised in Deuteronomy 28 to treat the nation of Israel. That's why this stuff matters. Like, we want to walk in righteousness. We want to get you know, righteous officials in place. We want to be a people that are committed to the Lord. I mean, there's so much that happens when you're walking with God as an individual, as a family, as a congregation, as a city, as a nation. There's so much good that happens by the blessings of God where he's like, if you're in agreement with me, I will bless you. If you're not in agreement with me, you're going to experience a whole lot of hardship, a whole lot of difficulties. And it says, the Lord will cause you to eat your own. Or, well, that's my interpretation of this whole massive passage. I'm not going to read it again. But mass, the, Deuteronomy 28, 53 through 57 is a lot of verses about this awful thing. T uh, previously, if you guys remember when we studied Leviticus 26, that was one of the passages we did in these sessions on Sunday nights. It was introduced in a phrase. <clears throat> the idea was dropped in just a phrase from Leviticus chapter 26. And we looked at it and we were shocked at it then, but it was just a phrase. Now it's Deuteronomy 28 and the curses uh, against Israel for disobedience are being laid out and he gives a whole paragraph. And it's with details that are just horrible. He says, look, he ends that passage or that portion of scripture with this severe warning. You can't talk about that subject matter, eating your own. You can't talk about that and then not end with a severe warning, and God does. And he says, if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and you do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants. It's really, really intense. So intense. By and large, the final generation of Jews, this is horrifying, by and large, the final generation of Jews will not be in agreement, by and large, with God. And he's going to use these covenantal promises to draw them back to himself. These statements, I am your God, and you will be my people. We've got to understand that's the motivation behind all this. This is not God just being angry and losing it and like, well, you did me dirty, so I'm going to do you dirty. These are actually redemptive. There is redemption in mind. But God is really serious about it, and he will not back down. And then, as if all that was not bad enough, then he talks about scattering them amongst the nations. The diaspora, again. The, looking at the, the spreading of the nations that we've got are spreading to the nations. You've got Israel, and right now, there's so many Jews over the course of this last generation that have been making Aliyah back to Israel. And God is going to spread them out again. It's going to happen again, where they're spread out all across the nations. That's not supposed to happen. That's their promised land. That's, that's dirt that God promised them. That's the nation that God gave to them. And it's like, he's like, now I will spread you out once again across the nations. And he writes it all the way back in Deuteronomy 28. So let's read it here. Uprooted from the promised land. This is Deuteronomy 28, 
We're looking at uh, 64 through 68. Then the Lord will scatter you among the nations. Then, what's the then? The After the Antichrist has come in and has just done every horrible thing in the land of Israel, and you know the timing is the Antichrist because wars will continue up until the peace treaty is signed. Wars fought by who? By Jews living in the land. They're fighting against the nations around it. But then a time comes when the nation of Israel is invaded by this fierce-looking king. And he comes in with such aggression and such anger that normally what happens is when a king comes and takes over a country, like he's expecting the population of that country to still be there to be able to run things. He's going to put magistrates in place and that kind of thing. The Antichrist is going to come into the nation of Israel and he's going to go on a hunting spree. He's going to look, he's looking for anybody who's Jewish. And he's going to come in with such just aggression. And so what's going to happen is to be Jewish in that hour will be a criminal offense. And they're going to have to run away from Israel in order to keep their own life. We're talking about a wild and crazy, painful moment. That's why the church has got to, the global church has got to understand the story because those Jews are going to be coming to Texas. Those Jews are going to be coming to everywhere on the planet. They're going to be looking for refuge. They're going to be running away from the, the epicenter of the Antichrist aggression, which will be set up in Jerusalem. The capital city of Israel will become the least safe place on the planet for Jewish people. And so, God says, then the Lord will scatter you among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you or your ancestors have known. Among those nations, you will find no repose, no resting place for the soles of your feet. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both day and night, never sure of your life. In the morning, you'll say, if only it were evening. And in the evening, you'll say, if only it were morning. Because of the terror that will fill your hearts and the sights that your eyes will see, the Lord will send you back in ships to Egypt on a journey I said you should never make again. There you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Okay, this is just, this, as awful as what we've already read is, this is an escalation even worse. You will no longer have a homeland and you will no longer have a peace of mind no matter where you go. Wherever you go, it won't work. This has not happened. This has never occurred. This piece right here has never, it's never happened that, the, that, the, that, that in a season of time, Israel was dispersed to all the nations and no matter where they went, they were freaked out 24-7, morning and night. Why would they be freaked out? Because the Antichrist is hunting them. They're freaked out because they're, they fled to this place, this one to that place, this family to that place, this single gal to that place. They fled in hopes to get away, but then the problem wasn't centric or, or wasn't confined to Israel. The problem becomes a global reality. The Antichrist is imposing his global system in every city, nation, place. And so now... Part of that national or that, that uh, empire-wide um, uh, agenda is to cause pain for the Jews to hunt for the Jews. And so the Jews are going to be like freaked out everywhere. They're gonna, we're going back to the days of Cory Ten Boom where we're going to be hiding Jews in order to keep them away from this oppressive reality. The problem is, as believers, we're also going to be in this oppressive reality, and there's going to be all sorts of problems that are going to be brought against us because as Christians, there's good things that we won't do and won't stand for and won't be a part of. We're looking at the most intense period of time scattered across the whole earth. The church needs to learn how to stand. The worship false gods. Now, that's an interesting thought process because the whole passage that we're looking at here is still future. This has not yet occurred. And yet it says that when the Jews go to this place and this place, they'll worship false gods. We look at that in modern day and go, surely not. Like, why would they do that? Well, because wherever they go, they're going to be looking for supernatural help. 
Because they're going to be fleeing supernatural problems. The problem is the majority of the Jews will be so uninstructed about their heritage that they will even look to the gods of whatever nations that they end up in. In some cases, now this isn't exactly what this verse is saying, but in some cases, those Jews are going to be getting saved. And the God that they're going to wind up serving that they had no idea about is actually their God, but it's Jesus. They're coming into that revelation. But part of the reason that we can actually know that even this whole subject of they're going to be worshiping false idols and false gods, there are so many end time passages that talk about the resurgence of idol worship, of witchcraft having such a place, of all sorts of deceit and false uh, religion being such a big and prevalent issue in the final days, in the last generation, so that Jews are going to flee from Israel during the Great Tribulation. And they're going to wind up in places so confused, so out of sorts, that they'll actually wind up worshiping the gods and the false religions and all the things where they land. Given over to an anxious mind, the challenges of all these plagues, the Antichrist aggression, the events of the judgments of the book of Revelation. Think about the events of the book of Revelation unfolding. Also, running away from the Antichrist. Also, you just lost your home. Also, also... All these problems and difficulties will culminate in a decade or so. I mean, there'll be things in the book of Revelation, or there's uh, the signs of the times will be building up, but you're talking about the most intense of all this stuff. It's happening in the final decade, really even final seven years. It's going to be unfolding in a very short period of time. People are going to be losing their mind. In the midst of trying, it will be the most trying time in human history. We're told that on a number of uh, different occasions in different passages in the scripture. And in that context, things will be unfolding. It will cause many to go mad. They will be overcome by anxiety and the pressures and the sights of the day. The sights you see will drive you mad. That doesn't mean the sights you see will make you cry. A mad person is a person that's lost their mind. They have, they have entered, they've, they've crossed a threshold of mental health where they are now not okay. They are now, they are mad. They're like, like when David was pretending to be a mad person and he's allowing drool to come down his beard. Okay, but these aren't going to be pretending. The difficulties will actually drive people mad. Among the nations you'll find no repose, no resting place for the soles of your feet. The Lord will give you to an anxious mind. Oh my gosh. Anxiety at such an incredible, intense level. <clears throat> and constant fear. You'll be in constant suspense. Can you imagine? We don't like suspense. I mean, maybe for a minute in a movie. But you want that thing to end. You want, you want the answer. Last thing you want is a cliffhanger or they're going to like, they'll bring out a sequel two years later. Like you, we don't like that suspense. These, the promise is God's like, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to cause you to live in that constant anxiety where you're in constant suspense, where there's no repose. There's no reprieve. He says, you're going to be at a place where you're going to be in the morning. You'll be like, I wish it was just night. And then, in the, then it's night. And you're like, oh no, I wish it was the morning. Constant suspense, constant fear. That is so intense. Well, Jesus actually spoke to this. He gave details, <clears throat> not just to the Jews, but to the whole earth describing the end time drama in uh, Luke chapter 21, 22 through 26. Look at this. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. He's talking about the Jews. Jesus here in Luke 21 is unpacking Deuteronomy 28. They will fall by the sword and they'll be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what's coming on the world. These are, this is the language of Deuteronomy 28. And it's Jesus quoting it about the end time drama. Even some will be sent back to Egypt, a path or a trip they were never supposed to take. There's going to be prison camps in Egypt. There's going to be prison camps in a lot of places that are going to be prison camps under the Antichrist's leadership. Look at this here, uh, Deuteronomy 28, and then we'll also read the Isaiah 51. The Lord will send you back in ships uh, to Egypt. Not 100% of the people, because we're, we're told that 
a hundred percent of the people are going to be dispersed across the earth to all the nations. So now he's zooming in and he's going, some of you are going to get on ships and these ships are prison transports. And some of you are going to be shipped back to Egypt, a trip I told you you should never make again. Uh, and there you'll offer yourselves as slaves and no one will buy you. Okay, look at uh, Isaiah 51 here. And worship team or worship leader, you can come on up. Isaiah 51 talks to us about what's going to be going on, not just in uh, Egypt, but in many places. And there's a bunch of verses that say this similarly. You'll live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor. It's talking about the Antichrist. This, is, this passage in Isaiah 51 is giving us the exact same language that we just read in Deuteronomy 28. You will live in constant terror every day. That's the same thing as you'll go to bed at night and be like, oh, I wish it was morning, and morning will be like constant suspense, all that stuff. But here it is in Isaiah 51. You'll live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor, because the Antichrist is hunting you, who is bent on destruction. For where is the wrath of the oppressor? The cowering prisoners will soon be set free. They will not die in their dungeon, nor will they lack bread. Now that's the good news. The bad news is they had to be in that dungeon in order to be set free from it. And this is, the, this is what we're reading in Deuteronomy 28. It's like, there's going to be dungeons. There's going to be prisons. There's going to be Jews that have been put into prison situations. And it's because they're Jewish in the last days. And then God is going to come in and rescue them. I mean, it's going to be a really profound thing when Jesus actually comes and sets the captives free. Literally, captives in chains, in prison, in dungeons. And Jesus literally sets them free. I love looking at set the captives free verses, talking about getting us out of our bondage of sin. I love that. We can use that. It's a secondary application. That is not the primary application. The primary application is Jesus Christ appearing in the sky, coming with a giant army, of resurrected saints and angels that can't die. And him going into prison camps and setting Jewish prisoners free from prison and saying, get in line, I'm your God. And they're all going to go, we're in, you're God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We see it now, you're the, you're the God of Deuteronomy 28 and everything else. So those passages that talk about setting captives free in their real primary context it's actually talking about Jesus setting Jews free from prison camps that the Antichrist has put them in after this second diaspora where, you know, the diaspora where they're all put out everywhere. All, all, the, all the, the, the Jews are spread out across all the nations and they're put in prison camps. Jesus is going to come and he's going to set those captives free. This story is big. This is as big as it gets. And while there are some painful, painful parts of it, some of the verses we looked at tonight, and it's like unthinkable. We don't have to like them, but we can't write them off. We can't dismiss them, and we can't not believe them. In fact, it's good to come to terms with how painful they are, because they're going to happen. And we, as the people of God, are going to be the ones that are supposed to be standing in the place of intercession and a, and a, a, a helping hand to the Jews in that hour that are in great need. So it's actually important that we understand the storyline so we can brace for impact and we can actually be that helping hand that we're supposed to be in that hour. So Father, we ask you for your help as we look at these hard passages, crazy phrases, painful things. We pray, Lord, would you use all the word of God and passages like Deuteronomy 28 to help prepare us, to brace us, God, so that we could be the victorious church at the end of the age with the love for the Jewish people that you've intended to even bring them to the point of jealousy and to salvation. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, this is now our prayer room again, so if you would take any conversations out into the lobby, we'll see you guys next week. The skin of love, your grace for me makes a mockery of the enemy we overcome by your blood in the pages of our history again and again i've seen your faithfulness your mercy was lost 
is now redeemed through the death that you died for me. Remind me of 